Hello, everyone. I'm Dani, and welcome to our podcast. Today, Great.com talks with Kulbushan Singh Suryansi, one of the ecologists at the, Leopard, at the Snow Leopard Trust in India. If you haven't heard about them, this foundation is dedicated to preserving the snow leopards and finding ways for them to coexist with the people sharing their habitat. And if you're new here to this podcast, press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app. Hello, Kulu. Welcome to our podcast. Hi, Danny. Thank you so much for having me here. Now, it's truly our pleasure. Well, I usually like to begin this podcast laying the ground for everyone. And I did some research and it turns out that India is the seventh largest country in the world, right? So I believe that there is such a vast range of wildlife. And you were working directly with high altitudes uh, ecosystems, right? So right. can you teach us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so yes, India is a very big and very diverse country geographically. What most people know India for are the tigers and the elephants and the rhinoceroses um, and, and, the, and the jungles uh, of the plains. But what most people don't know is that India also has a huge, uh, big mountain range, the Himalaya in the north. And in fact, um, this area is very good habitat for the snow leopard, uh, which, is, which is, people think of them as this cute large cat, uh, but don't associate them with a tropical country like India, um, where, where they're very commonly found. And that is what we uh, specialize on in our research and conservation. Well, yeah, I would certainly be one of these people that had no clue about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, where you find this, this cats, this leopards, are they in direct contact with people or it's a preserved area just for them? Okay, so in India and in Asia, you have two kinds of leopards. One is the common leopard, which is much slightly bigger, yellowish, and lives in the forest. The other is the snow leopard, which is what I work on. And snow leopards live in the very high mountains of Asia. They're actually found in 12 countries. Uh, in the north, you know, they, they found in the southern parts of Russia in the Altai Mountains. And then all of Central Asia, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, China, um, um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and then in the south, all along the Himalayan mountain range, India, Nepal, Bhutan, um, on the, these countries. Yes, when you say are they in conflict with people, yes, snow leopards do get into trouble with people because they kill a lot of livestock sheep, goat, cows, horses, even yaks sometimes. And the people who tend to these livestock are, are marginal herders, you know, they're poor people uh, very often. And so they find it difficult to, to bear the burden of the leopard killing their animals. And that is one of the, one of the tension points between local people and, and snow leopards. But of course, there are, there are many other things about, about leopards that I'd be happy to talk about. Oh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you are. <laughs> and uh, what exactly is the role of the trust in this scenario? So the Snow Leopard Trust, we directly work in five of these 12 range countries of the Snow Leopard. And in India, our country partner is Nature Conservation Foundation. I have a position there as well. Um, in India, the Snow Leopard Trust and, and our work started by trying to help uh, farmers and herders bear the cost of living with snow leopards. And, and that was essentially to try and help them get compensation for the animals that they lose to snow leopards. And so we started with some interesting models of compensation. One of them is where herders pool together money as premium and create their own insurance for livestock. And every time the snow leopards kills an animal, um, they, they compensate themselves from this corpus that they have built. Um, more recently though, government compensation schemes have improved and our organization also helps train people to access this compensation in case they lose animals. 
So we train people all along this Snorleopards distribution range to how do you fill out the forms? What do you do if Snorleopard kills your animal? And how do you get compensation from the government? You know, because if they get compensation, then they don't have a reason to dislike uh, the animal. That's how we started our work. However, conservation problems are not limited to snorepers killing livestock and herders being upset with them. Uh, we are also trying to work with some of the very large uh, companies uh, which have interest here. And one of them is Kashmir. Uh, the fiber, uh, it's a wool that is made into sweaters. It's one of the most expensive kind of fibers. And it is, in, it is in great demand in Europe and, and US. It's a fashion, it's a luxury fashion item. And a large part of it comes, in fact, 90% of it comes from the 12 range countries that I told you, from the snow leopard habitat, where herders grow, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to goats whose wool it is. And every time snow leopards kill these goats, it's a huge economic loss because Kashmir is a is a highly prized commodity. And in some ways, uh, what we don't realize is if you're wearing cashmere sweater in Europe, you're essentially only one link away from the snow leopard and it's a remote habitat. And, and we're also trying to work with the supply chain and makes, make cashmere more sustainable. Uh, so these are some of the things that we do as an organization. Wow, oh, it's very, very interesting because, well, I never wore cashmere. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it, it's one thing, again, that I didn't know. I, I didn't have any idea of that chain, you know, the, the connections that would put us just one link away from, from the snow leopard. Wow. Yeah, that, that's, and, that's the interesting thing. We often think snow leopards live in these remote high mountains in this idyllic, pristine habitat. But we live in a globalized world and, and our actions have, have effects in far off corners of this planet. And, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to talk about how, uh, you know, living in Europe still affects remote mountains uh, in, in Asia. Yeah, but that, I loved it. I, that's exactly what we need here. <laughs> Because sometimes we, we show uh, people uh, different organizations and it gets distant, you know, gets, oh, okay, so that's great. Huh? Big cats in India, yay, good for you. But, you know, it's, it's important for us to understand how close those issues are. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I believe that when doing that, when trying to, let's say, mitigate these damages, like these economical uh, problems that might arise, There are probably many challenges you face when doing that, right? Uh, so yeah. what exactly do you see happening? Yeah, so, you know, we, we try to address this from many different dim dimensions. One is uh, we are also an ecological research organization. We study the snow leopard, their prey species very closely. Uh, in Mongolia, we have one of the longest running snow leopard research programs, 15 years of continuous deep research on the snow leopards. In India, we've, we've got a 20-year-old research program to study the biology and ecology of the snow leopard, their prey species, and, and the ways of how people live in, in these landscapes. So everything from how do these prey species graze the pastures to how snow leopards uh, kill them and how that, you know, that affects the, the whole ecosystem. We study those aspects as well. We also study people and their societies using, using you know, ideas in social sciences and, and all this research gets published as peer-reviewed papers in international journals. And, and then when we are implementing ideas of conservation, those ideas are informed by all this research. Uh, of course, there are practical challenges. You know, when you're, when you're speaking to a new community of people, you have to do trust building. You cannot just come from the outside and start preaching uh, the need for, for creating compensation plans or, or start preaching for conservation. Um, and our approach always has been that we work in these areas for a very long time. So some of the sites that we are working in India, uh, we've been working there continuously for the past 25 years. 
these were these were projects that were started by my supervisors and now i lead it and very soon i have students who are ready to uh, to to lead these efforts the you know if i if i start listing out challenges every every program has different challenges there are many challenges ranging from the weather going bad and you finding yourself stranded with snow everywhere uh, to the roads getting flushed to miscommunication between people uh, where you know the message gets wrongly translated and then then people take offense at what you're trying to say to sometimes getting the ecology wrong we design a program but you know we've made certain assumptions or based on on a certain kind of knowledge which is not accurate and and then then you can get into problems with that all of those happen over 25 years we we've, we've had had many different kinds of problems uh, but uh, what is what is important is that we work continuously in a place we what we don't want to do is do something here leave go somewhere else then do something there and forget about how these programs are doing and now you know 25 years later there are villages where we've been continuously working this for this entire duration and we've accumulated a lot of learnings and experiences which we've tried to translate as as books and papers and documents for for others to learn from um you know some of the some of the easy problems to have are what i was mentioning weather related problems you know where you're stuck in the wrong place for for a long time and although it's very uncomfortable dealing with the cold the high elevation all of that that's in the in the grand scheme of things that's also what makes this job adventurous and exciting i think the more serious problems are when you have misunderstandings with people or misunderstanding with the government officials and and they take a long time to resolve especially in times like these with the pandemic you know you cannot meet people on a daily basis and when you are further away the chances of misunderstanding are are higher and 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 those tend to be the the more serious kind of challenges yeah which makes lots of sense i think because it's truly harder to solve that you know yeah but I'm, I'm I kept thinking here because uh we truly don't see well when I say we of course I do not include you <laughs> but uh sometimes we don't see how uh this human aspects such as culture language policies all that actually affect the practical life of uh an ecosystem right because it's not just hunting it's it's you know uh human activity pushes animals away and that's all of that so yeah yeah i i can you tell us a bit more about this system yeah. this ecological system so we can have a clear idea of what goes yeah. on there so uh you know before before i come to the ecological system what i want to talk a bit about is is this idea of different cultures different languages mm -hmm. so nepal is found in 12 countries all these countries are by themselves very diverse and so no two places are similar and which is why it's not a but trust we do not work directly in these countries we work with country partners these are organizations which are based in these countries and work there uh you know so we we not trying to helicopter in from the outside and and impose ideas on people we we find the people in these countries who want to do conservation there and and you know it's a it's a more socially responsible way of doing conservation um but then to come to your point about uh you know what what these ecosystems look like um mainly like these places have uh what are called range lands you know these are large grasslands at high elevation areas which are grazed by several species of wild herbivores and several species of livestock wild herbivores by themselves are very interesting species like the blue sheep or the ibex or the argali or the urial these are these are all different kinds of mountain goats antelopes and uh, uh sheep and then there are domestic animals that people people uh, graze in these areas the the goat sheep cow horses donkeys yaks and there are two kinds of things happen which is these livestock can outcompete the wild herbivores for food 
you know, because there's just so many livestock, they can just eat up the pasture and, and there's not enough food for wild herbivores. The other thing is snow leopards, given a, a chance, would also eat these livestock. And uh, our goal is to conserve the snow leopard. And if, if they eat too much livestock, people get angry and then they don't want to support snow leopard conservation. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, one of, one of our, our day-to-day uh, goal is also to try and minimize the impact that snow leopards have on this livestock and try to have a healthy wild herbivore population and, you know, to support snow leopard populations. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, very often people tell me, oh, because there is not enough wild herbivores, is that why snow leopards kill livestock? And actually, that's that's not necessarily true. If you have a herbivore and a goat in the same place, the carnivore will eat the goat and ignore the wild herbivore because it's harder to catch a wild animal. It's easier, easier to catch a goat. And, and snow leopards would do that too. So... Um, and actually, when you have more wild herbivores, there are also going to be more snow leopards who can kill more goats. And so we, we, we study these kind of interactions and depending on the context of the situation, try and minimize snow leopards killing these goats. So sometimes we help herders predator proof their corrals. You know, corrals are the places where they keep the goats at night. And we help them with construction so that snow leopards will not be able to get inside them. Uh, in other places uh, where people, you know, where there are other challenges, we help them create uh, corp- you know, compensation corpus. As an additional strategy, we also work with people to set aside some pastures uh, where wild herbivore populations can do better, and and you know, and that will help snow leopard conservation uh, in the long run. Uh, we also help people generate income. We, we work with a women's group. Uh, actually, we work with several women's group in different countries and help them uh, create merchandise and handicrafts that we help market so that they can get additional income uh, as, as custodians of snow leopards. And so we try to come up with these different ways of, of helping herders live and benefit from living with snow leopards. Um, or, or living in, in areas surrounding snow leopards. Oh, it's a, it's really a wide range of actions. I think that's great. Yes, one of the that's that's one of the challenges. Which is, I'm I'm trained as an ecologist. I, I have a PhD on, in studying snow leopards. But then when you get to conservation on the ground, it's just so much more than just you know pretty pictures and and pretty mountains and. Uh, and biology, you know, uh, the biology is crucial, but it's not enough. Mm-hmm. You also have to understand people, you have to understand societies and, and also be empathetic in, in trying to understand other people's perspective that why their life might be more difficult uh, because there are these carnivores. And if you can make their life a little easier, then the possibility for them to live with a big carnivore becomes easier. And, and that's what we're trying to do. Wow, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and just to try to end, unfortunately, our conversation today, <laughs> for everyone listening here right now, how can we help your, your actions in the trust? Uh, thank you, uh, Danny. Well, I mean, the, the easiest is probably to go to Snow Leopard Trust website, snowleopard.org, and to donate, support, uh, you know, just just help create awareness about this organization. Uh, anything you can do, they, you know, on, on the snorapet.org website, there are several ways in, you know, that, that have been explained that, that people can help. Uh, if you are, if you want to go beyond that, uh, write to some of us, write to me if you want to directly contribute uh, to, to conservation in these regions. Of course, we're living through a pandemic, international travel and those things are difficult. Uh, also, sometimes international travel is more damaging to conservation than the help that an individual might provide. So I'll, I'll encourage you to try and find solutions to local ecological problems and then to support organizations uh, who are supporting other people in their uh, their native uh, areas. I'm, I'm an Indian. I work for Snorapur Trust in India. 
uh, and so if you support it's not about trust that support will eventually reach me uh, or my colleagues in in other countries uh, i think that's that's the that's the most straightforward way to to help out perfect well thank you so very much kolo for joining us today it's been a great talk thank you dani thank you for the opportunity to talk about snow leopards and conservation with with your great audience <laughs> truly our pleasure and for everyone listening also thank you so much and if you enjoyed this episode press subscribe on youtube or in your podcast app because that will show the algorithms that this is an important conversation and more people can learn about the importance of this snow leopard trust see you at the next episode <laughs>